hi guys welcome to my channel yes i'm starting a channel um so this is intimate art i've been coming up with a way to really hone in on how i'm going to pursue a career in coaching and it's so crazy that um i had a complete shift right i wanted to go for this corporate coaching type of situation and my coach somebody that i'm very proud to call my coach she nudged me and she said you have way deeper shit to, to basically be talking about to to guide people and help people in and so i challenged myself to come up with a concept that will connect people and force people to express themselves communicate what they feel communicate their experiences and I really tapped into my own self and I said, what are some things that connect people? Different cultures, different backgrounds. And that's food and art. And food is art, it can be art, culinary art, right? So this is something that I've been doing for a long time. I've always grown up in the arts. I sing, dance, draw, like these are things that I grew up doing. And um, I realized that through my high school and uh, whatever time I did spend in college, through my art is how I express my experiences. So this channel is going to be very, very, very specific to communicating your thoughts, your feelings, your experiences, and connecting them to some kind of a creative art form. So I'm going to start with telling my story through my creative art forms. Whatever many art forms that I've, you know, put out there to the universe that I actually held on to, which is honestly not many, but um, in sharing those experiences, taking a walk down memory lane, re recounting my thoughts, my steps, and telling you guys what that was like is going to be the greatest joy. There's such a liberation in communicating your experiences that you keep to yourself. So hoping that my story will inspire so many other people and I'm going to open up this channel to anybody who wants to create art or have a talent and want to express themselves and showcase their, their talent and showcase what they have. On this channel, we will be discussing topics around sexual abuse, healthy approaches to sexual advances, domestic violence, uh, family dysfunction, mental health, sexual orientations, all the things considered taboo amongst different cultures. You know, I'm looking to definitely open up this channel to many different cultures. Anybody who has never met me, my name is Canola. I do have a blended family. Um, my husband is straight from Ghana. Uh, so that's an experience to talk about that I look forward to telling you guys about um, sometime in the future. And so, yeah, so these issues are near and dear, have an interest. Keep watching. So I remember my art teacher in college gave us an assignment where we had to pick a picture and draw it recreate it make it our own and i came across a picture of a woman laying in a cave she was bare naked um the back her backside was exposed and i felt like this was a great opportunity to tell my story um so Looking at this picture, you can definitely see all the kinds of adjectives that describe what I went through. At this point, I was in college, so had, I had definitely already had come across two different forms of sexual violence. I had not yet gone through my domestic violence relationship but, you know, there were so many relationships, so many situations that I came across that caused a lot of these feelings to come out. 
So I was sexually abused by my dad um, between the ages of four and eight years old. That was really tough to get over. Um, looking over the years after it all happened, obviously once I got into high school, middle school, and I started to, to come into myself, it definitely changed the way that I viewed men and viewed relationships. My dad, we had a relationship that was typical to any other father-daughter relationship. And we lived in the same house, obviously. Like he was, I was daddy's little girl. I was the only girl. I have three brothers. I'm the only female and I'm the youngest in my household growing up. And um, it was very difficult to talk about. My dad used to have me watch pornography and we watched it together before we got into these sexual acts. And I really felt special, like this was our time, our daddy and daughter time that was away from my brothers, away from my mom. And I really felt special. I felt like it was our bonding time. I had no idea, obviously, it's not something that we should be doing. He did tell me um, in, in going through it that, you know, don't tell mommy, don't tell anybody. It's like, you know, this is, this is our thing. And I kept it secret. I felt like it was something to be cherished, something to be sacred, something that was supposed to be kept quiet. And um, that's what I did for a long time. So I realized that what me and my dad were doing was wrong because I had uh, uh, someone that I considered my best friend at the time. She lived nearby me and she, crazily enough, was experiencing the same exact thing with her dad. And she told her story. She had told her mom at that age, we was around eight years old at this time. She told her mom at eight years old that this is what was going on. She had slipped a note into her mom's slipper saying basically this is what's going on. And when she told me she did that and what was going on, I was like, oh my gosh, that's the same thing that's going on with me. Her telling me that is when I realized that what we were doing was wrong. So from the age of eight and on, I had officially known that what was going on was not okay. When my friend told her mom, somehow, obviously, her mom told my parents about what had come out. And so my dad became alarmed and he separated that friendship. I wasn't allowed to go to her house. She wasn't allowed to come to mine. That was the end of our relationship for an extended amount of time. I'm, I can't recall how long we stopped being friends for, but we stopped being friends for a while. Yeah. So I did live with my dad after knowing that obviously this is wrong. He had stopped once my friend's issue came out, her story, he had stopped sexually abusing me. I think at this point he realized that I knew what he was doing was wrong and he was very scared of me telling. So we all lived in the same house. I still kept it a secret. It was very uncomfortable, but again, I still felt like this was our secret. Like it was something that was done between the, 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 the two of us and um, I think I had, well, I know I had, I had a huge fear that me telling, looking at what was going on with my friend's situation, that it would break up our family. My friend, it was just, it was her, her brother, they did not share the same father. So her father who was sexually abusing her was not her brother's father and her mom and, um, they had a smaller family basically, not that it makes it so much different, but because me and my family, we all live in the same house. I 
guess we all share the same dad. I felt like it would have been it would have had a greater impact because I wouldn't just be telling my story. I would be breaking up our entire family. So when I actually did tell, so I told when I was about 13 years old is when I told my mom. I told my mom that it happened and the only reason why I told her, well, to be honest with you, I was waiting for a perfect time to tell her and there was no perfect time to tell her. And so I had got caught cutting school and I used that experiences to deflect me from being in trouble for cutting school. Yes, that's what I did. I was at court cutting school and she was, my mom was yelling at me and flipping out. And you know, I said, at this point I was old enough to start making these connections. I knew that I had started acting out, cutting school, being promiscuous because of my experiences with my dad. I had already made this connection by 12, 13 years old. So the reason why I chose that moment to tell her was because it was a direct um, response to me being sexually abused. I was cutting school. I would think I wanted to go see some boy or just doing something I had no business doing and I got caught. And so I decided that, that in that moment to tell my mom, hey, look, listen, just, you know, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. I mean, I don't know how to, how to tell you, but um, my dad, when I was younger, he was molesting me he was sexually abusing me and um she sat there stuck faced and um she asked me like 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 to to clarify like what was i really saying and i told her exactly i repeated myself and i told her what it was During this time that I also had told my my mom, one thing that I did not mention in that is that, yes, I got caught cut in school. I told her because it was a direct response to the sexual abuse. In addition to that, my father was no longer in the home with us. He had decided to move out maybe about two years or a year and a half prior to me telling my mom when I was about 13. And they had began a custody battle my brother was placed in a temporary custody of my father. My two oldest brothers were old enough. They was just, I think my oldest brother was living with a girlfriend. My other brother was staying with my aunt at this point. I don't remember them still being in the house. I really don't. If they was, they were never there. Um, but yeah, they had already separated which made me feel a lot more safe to tell my mom. And so, yeah, we did pursue legal charges, pressing charges against him, in addition to the whole court case battle they, that they was going through. That was a really difficult time for me to, to go through, like telling strangers what was going on with me. I didn't need to just tell my mom. Now I was talking to a complete stranger, strangers that were foreign to me, different kinds of faces. I would go get tests done in the hospital. I had to go into the court to testify against my dad. Luckily, I think they, did, they didn't They did have him in the courtroom at the time, but I remember his lawyer trying to make it look like, I don't know, I felt so uncomfortable. I don't remember the specifics around what the questions his lawyer was asking me, but he asked me very uncomfortable questions. I felt so much pressure. And long story short, my dad was never charged with sexual abuse, molestation, whichever which way you want to put it. He was never charged because I had waited too long to say something. So the physical evidence against him, when I went to get tested, they did see that um, there was some kind of sexual activity going on. They did see that I had been sexually abused, but... There was no specific DNA of my father still living present in me to be able to present that to the court and say he did X, Y, Z. So.
He walked. To be honest with you, do I don't think that jail is always the best form of punishment. I think that it gives people a sense of safeness and security knowing that this person will be locked away and unable to perform such acts against anyone else. Absolutely. But you know, me knowing that my father never was jailed. I've seen my father on a few occasions. He still continued to pay child support to my mom. That's a whole nother story. I ended up teaming up with my dad to take my mom to court because my mom wasn't giving me the child support at some point. That's a whole nother uh, storyline. Um, but I have spent time in my father's presence by ourselves with other people and tried to act very normal. And um, I know that he goes through life and he looks at me now I haven't spoken to him for, for a very long time, and I'll tell you guys why in, in a later video. I haven't spoken to him in a long time, but I know that he goes through life watching other fathers and their children interact, watching episodes on TV, movies, and he's basically always going to be reminded of the fact that he does not have the opportunity to connect with me on a father-daughter level. I don't think, he doesn't even connect with his sons. His fatherhood was just diminished after that incident. I think for the sake of family, whatever that's supposed to mean, especially when you talk about me and my household, whatever that's supposed to mean, we tried to come around each other during holidays for a couple of years to kind of see each other, sit, eat, just to stay connected in some way, shape or form. But I knew that my dad was receiving his punishment in other ways. So was I ever mad that he never was jailed? Not necessarily, not necessarily, no. I do genuinely wish that he was able to reconciled with me differently or kept his word because he told me some things that um I asked him some questions and he said that he will be willing to do a couple of things and he never did them and I'll talk about that later on but yeah am I mad that he was never jailed do I feel some type of way no being sexually abused by my dad has had a tremendous effect on me um, and the way that I've approached relationships, approached sex, questioned my sexual orientation. I mean, everything under the sun that you can think of, I think I've attempted, thought about, tried as a direct result of being sexually abused. The first time that I had sex, the first time that I wanted to have sex, I did not have any emotional attachment to the person that I decided to have sex with. None. I actually went into it with the thought of, I just want to have the experience to get it over with. I had known that my first time being with a guy would not be special because it, although it would be like me breaking my virginity, I knew that I had no hymen. I knew that it would not be special. And a part of me didn't care to wait and have this head over heels relationship with a guy. Me tell them that I've never had sex before for our first time to, to be, well, what the hell you didn't bleed. You know, guys looked for that as a trophy or looked for that just to see if a version is actually a version. And I knew that I wouldn't have that. So I just didn't care about it at all. At all. I 
I explore a relationship with girls. My friend, remember I was telling you about the friend who told me that she was sexually abused as well? She was the first female that was that I was sexually intimate with, exploring. We explored each other. She was more so the aggressor. You know, she wanted to explore that with me. We both were curious young women who had been sexually abused. So, you know, you got to keep that in mind when, and I'm talking about young, like we were, we were young. We were like nine years old. And we would, she would touch me and we would look at each other's private areas and he was young, absolutely. And we did that for a while up until obviously we decided to pursue guys and we had already been familiarizing ourselves with sex with our bodies, you know, yeah. Um, so my experience with women started with her at that very young age when I knew that this is what sex was. This is a major question that I think is going to, I'm not gonna be able to answer the question completely in this video because that definitely ties into my family dysfunction issues, but um, they questioned me at first and then I guess as I grew older, this is for my immediate family, by the way, I'm talking about my mom. My mom believed me. By the way, I feel that my mom has told me, and I'm gonna speak about this again in another video. My mom felt like she knew, and I, from an outside source, when we were going through the whole trial, I was told from an outside source who she had spoken to about the situation, made it look like she knew what was going on at the time but we're not gonna get into that my brothers questioned me for a while like i guess it was like a little this is their dad too so i guess that was really awkward i guess they believed me i know that they probably ended up believing me as i got older and they started to see me act out be promiscuous and have all the things align that people describe as effects of a victim of sexual abuse. I think that that's when everything kind of started to make sense for them. As I got older, they started to see me become a, a young woman. Um, My grandmother, my dad's mom, I feel like I was largely impacted by the responses from my grandmother and my grandparents, I have my grandmother, his mom, and my dad's father, my dad's father's wife. So my step-grandmother. My grandmother was also sexually abused when she was a child by her mom's, my great-grandmother's ex-husband. And my dad knew this. There's so many questions that I have about that scenario, about that situation. But I feel like I was robbed of a perfect opportunity to be able to connect with my grandmother around an issue around sexual abuse. But obviously this is with her son. Her son caused the sexual abuse to me, which if he knew this about his mother, that his mother was sexually abused, then why the hell would you sexually abuse your daughter? So many questions around that. How did they get there? My grandmother also paid for my dad's lawyer and all of the legal fees that helped in getting him off. Um, so that relationship with my grandmother was very strained. I did see my mother, um, I did see my grandmother a couple of times after that and I really tried to, I surprised her one year. I had to keep away from my grandmother and my grandfather for a specific amount of years. I think once I turned 17 or 18 because of the whole case situation. But once I was able to go see her, I surprised her at her house. And you know what she told me? I can't do that. I can't surprise her at her house. 
that was devastating. That was devastating after not seeing her for some years, after her not seeing her granddaughter, her only granddaughter, her only granddaughter. She only has one son, my father. So I'm her only granddaughter. I'm my father's only daughter. He doesn't have any children outside of me and my three brothers. I go see my grandmother after a couple of years of not seeing each other. And she says, I cannot surprise her at her house. I will never forget that. I will never let that sleep. Um, it's something that sticks out to me and one of the memories of my grandmother that I wish never happened, but it is, it is what it is. My father's father, my grandfather, he has done a great job of trying to keep the pieces and keep the peace. Um, we've always maintained a relationship. He'll check on me. He kind of almost stepped into the role of my dad, but at a distance. He'll check in um, every now and then. He was present at my baby shower. You know, I just celebrated my son's first birthday and they made it their business to be there of everybody because nobody else was there. <laughs> they made it there. I invited them, they made it there. I was really proud of that. Um, but I will tell you this, I went to go see them two years ago, Thanksgiving. And when I went to their house, they have a china cabinet, all these pictures right, of their children, they have a blended family. So between them two, my grandfather and his new wife, outside of my grandmother, my father's mother, they share two boys. And she had three daughters previous to that marriage. So all of their family pictures are in the China cabinet and all of the pictures of me and my family, my father's children, uh, I tucked away in a photo album in the cabinet. I made that observation and um, I was disappointed. I kept it to myself, but I definitely made that observation. And through the years, I realized that, and I always want them to ask me questions about my dad. Have you spoke to him? Have you spoken to your grandmother? What are your feelings around it? You're older now, so how do you feel like it's affected you? Do you feel like there's something different that I could have done as your grandfather. How do you want us to respond to you around this issue? Do we actually believe you? Like all these questions, they don't talk about it. Like they will avoid these conversations at almost any cost. I think it was um, my dad, he was hospitalized. I think everybody thought he had cancer. He, I don't think he had cancer. He had issues with his kidneys or some kind of internal organs, but people were thinking that he wasn't gonna be with us for much longer. And I think they, yeah, they, they did ask me. They asked me, have I spoken to him? And I said, no. And I had not even known that he was going through all of this. And I said, no. And they didn't even bother to tell me that he was going through this. Like I had to speak to my brothers after the fact. I'm like, oh, hey, yeah, you know, I spoke to granddad. You know, they asked me if I spoke to dad. I said, no. And it's like, oh, well, you know, daddy's in the hospital. Like, they have more information about my dad's uh, hospitalization. And I had no idea. Had no, had no details. But they are more in communication with my dad, obviously, than me. I decided to stop, to stop speaking to him a couple of years ago. Yeah. So of the images that were presented for me to choose from, I chose the blank canvas of a woman in a dark cave to express my story and the story of many other women. It is uh, an unfortunate reality that the very assets that make us women, meaning, you know, our breasts, our bodies, our curvature, those physical attributes are desired by the opposite sex or even the same sex, but those are what make us women for the most part, right? And those are the same things that make us target as well to a sexual predator. And so a lot of times when we walk by women on the streets, you know, when we see a woman that we're attracted to, we look at her body, we look at her face, we look at the physical parts of her without ever knowing what she's truly been through so 
we have this woman the original image was of a european woman um from a very long time ago like she's in a cave so we know it's a long time ago we don't know what she looks like from the front all we see is the back of her so i recreated her to accentuate certain assets of hers to again create this overly appealing sexual look from behind and i painted her with all of the adjectives that describe a woman who has been sexually abused beaten raped um, maybe have experienced domestic violence. I, at this point, had not yet been experiencing domestic violence. Uh, but again, this was my canvas to, to not only tell my story, but the story of other women. And so I thought that this image was the greatest opportunity to express that. Well, as life would have it, I have not picked up a pen, a crayon, a marker, a pencil, and um, created in a very long time. I haven't really picked up a mic. I mean, I sing in the shower, I sing around the house. Um, and I would like to get back to that. So that's a part of the reason why I'm creating this particular platform because it gives me the opportunity to tap back into my artistry and to give me the opportunity to create, inspire others to create while working toward impacting the community, impacting the people in a positive way. Um, we all have obviously seen an artistic expression of some type of message. And um, I wanna continue to utilize that to bring forth and create a new norm. We have to create new norms for our society that is rapidly changing. It is so scary. I think of things all the time as to what and the question, what the future will look like for my young children. And um, I definitely wanna be a part of that impact. And um, I think that, I know that rather that uh, that's gonna be, it's gonna be the greatest way to impact into my art. Thank you guys for watching. If this is something that you want to hear more about, if you enjoyed watching this first official episode, please like, comment, and subscribe. If you would like to share your story on this platform, please do not hesitate to leave me feedback, reach out to me so I can feature you on a future episode of Intimate Art. You can contact me at consultcanola at gmail.com. I am active on Instagram. I need to be more active, by the way. So definitely um, get in touch with me on my Instagram, which is consult underscore canola. Uh, yeah, so I look forward to hearing from you soon. And I will be back. Thanks for watching.